Good morning and welcome to worship with North Avenue Presbyterian Church. We are delighted to be among those leading worship this morning, and we know you're there, and we are praying for you as you gather around computers and iPads and televisions to worship the Lord together with your brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ here among the body of Christ that is North Avenue Presbyterian Church. We would love to know that you're here, and you can do that by typing hello or good morning or whatever you might say um, to encourage your brothers and sisters. You can type it in the comments there in the live stream. If, however, you find that to be distracting, you can hide the comments by clicking in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. That brings it to full screen and it will hide the comments. But we had a number of people say how encouraging it was to them last week to see the numbers climb as those of you who worshiped with us online logged in and we could see the number of uh, screens that were connected to this live stream. So welcome to worship this morning. I'd like to offer a call to worship from Psalm 46 from the message, Eugene Peterson's translation of scripture. Hear the word of the Lord. God is a safe place to hide, ready to help when we need him. We stand fearless at the cliff edge of doom, courageous in sea storm and earthquake, before the rush and roar of oceans, the tremors that shift mountains, Jacob wrestling God fights for us. God of the angel armies protects us. Come and see the works of the Lord, the desolation he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come before you in adoration this morning. Fill our hearts with your presence and with the firm statement of faith that indeed you are God and we can be quiet. May you be exalted among all of the nations. May you be exalted in our hearts and in our lives and in our worship before you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we're going to sing a hymn together. It may feel a little odd for you to stand and sing in your own living room, but however it is you would like to sing, the words will be printed on the screen. However, if you have a hymnal, you'll find the hymn number 142, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Let's sing. Yeah. 
join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. It is my uh, distinct honor today to lead our prayer of confession. I'll start by saying this is the first time I've confessed uh, live before electronic audience, and this feels strange, but it also feels very um, honest. And for all of us to do this in our homes is a great practice in what it's like to have a prayer life uh, at home on our own. But we are reminded by our, um, the folks who've come before us that this is a corporate event when the body of the church joins their hearts together and confesses before God. Today we'll be, joined, um, we'll be joining the scriptures as they acknowledge our need for God. We'll start with a brief moment of silence, and then I will pray us through Psalm 90. Let's pray. God, hear our hearts as they come before you broken and contrite would you hear our prayers of confession lord you have been our dwelling place in all generations, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. We come before you humbly, reminded that you turn us back to dust. You sweep away our days like they were a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning, we have the assurance that you wipe away our sins. Lord, might we not be consumed in anger? Might we not be consumed in fear? We ask, how long, O oh Lord? Teach us to number our days. Make us glad as many days as you have offered us. Let the labor of the Lord God be upon us. Let the favor of the Lord God be upon us and prosper us the work of our hands. O oh, prosper the work of our hands. God, thank you for this promise that assures us that you cover. You have been our dwelling place in all generations before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. Amen. Roxy Chess will offer a moment for children next, and I'm going to warn you that this word is probably for all of us. <laughs> well, good morning, North Avenue family. I am delighted to be here again online with you. I get to share good news. I know we don't get to hear a lot of that lately, but I am so excited. In my bag here, my bag of tricks for this season, I have... And you all know what this means, a rose. That means we have a new member of our North Avenue family. Lillian Rose Bowers was born on March 18th, 2020. And her parents are Kirk and Andrea Bowers. Her grandparents are De Dan and Deborah Lowry. And her big brother is Ezra. So we just delight in the celebration of this beautiful baby girl that's joined us and joined the world. And we pray for this family and this time. Well, I hope you all are doing well and adjusting to all the changes that have gone on in your life this week. I know that I've experienced some changes and I'm sure you all have too. I've been thinking about all of the things that have been happening. And I was talking to my friend, Miss Kim, last week. And she was saying, you know what? I'm just going to worry about today and not worry about tomorrow because I got enough worries today. 
and I don't need to, I don't have time to worry about tomorrow yet. And I was like, oh, you know what? That makes me think of all the things that I'm worried about too. There's so many things right now. It's kind of overwhelming with all these changes. And it kind of got me thinking that worries are like bubbles. Okay, work with me on this. So here is the first example. I've got worries that are, see if I can get this out here. They never make these things easy to get out. Some of you might have better fingers than I do. But worries can be big and they can be small, but they are all like bubbles. And you know what? Some bubbles are big and some bubbles are small. So I have small worries like that. Like, when will I get to go see a movie again? Or when will I get to go shoe shopping? The small worries. <laughs> Thanks, Megan. <laughs> but then I have some big worries, kind of like these big bubbles here. Don't worry, Jean, I'll clean this up. Ooh, some bigger bubbles. Let me see if I get some more bigger bubbles. Like some of my bigger worries right now, kind of thinking about my parents up in Minnesota, and I can't be there to help them right now. That's kind of a big worry I have. And then, in this season, it seems like there are a lot of worries. In fact, so many worries that sometimes they feel like they're going to just overwhelm you. It just seems like there's nothing that will stop them, and they keep coming and coming, and they come when you're sleeping, they come when you're eating, they're always there. It's kind of like, oh, they just keep on coming. Oh my goodness, all of these worries. Well, you know what? Of course, Jesus has something to say about all these worries. Let's go to his word and see what he has to tell us. Wherever Jesus went, lots of people went too. They loved being near him. Old people, young people, all kinds of people came to see Jesus. Sick people, well people, happy people, sad people, and worried people. Lots of them. Worrying about lots of things. What if we don't have enough food? Or clothes? Or suppose we run out of money? What if there isn't enough and everything goes wrong? and we won't be all right. What then? When Jesus saw all the people, his heart was filled with love for them. They were like a little flock of sheep that didn't have a shepherd to take care of them. So Jesus sat them all down, and he talked to them. He first pointed out the birds, and he said, look over there. Do you think the birds are worried about what, what to eat? Do you think their pantries are stocked full? Oh, the people laughed. Who's ever seen a bird grocery shopping? Jesus said, that's because they know that God will take care of them. Then he pointed to the beautiful flowers and he said, oh, look at those flowers. Are they concerned about what they're wearing? Are they, are they all worried about it? And everyone laughed. Who's seen a flower in a beautiful dress? No, said Jesus. They don't need to worry about those things because they can trust God. Jesus knew that the people were listening, and he said, little flock, you are more important than the birds, more important than the flowers. The birds and the flowers don't sit about worrying about things, and God doesn't want his children to worry either. God loves to look after the birds and the flowers, and he loves to look after you too. Jesus knew that God would always love and watch over the world he had made, everything in it. Birds, flowers, trees, animals, everything. And most of all, his children. It's a pretty powerful word for us today. All of these worries that we have, God knows them. He wants us to share them with him. He wants us to share them with others who love us so that we can come together and just share those things out. And he wants us to know that we can trust him with our worries and we can release them. In fact, it is kind of like this bubble. 
when I pray and I release my fears and worries to God, off they go, and I can watch them float, and God can handle each and every one of them and take care of all my worries. Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you that you are good, that you love us so much. Thank you that you care for us and take care of us. God, help us to release our worries to you. Help us to encourage each other in this time. And God, help us to remember we can trust you no matter what. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, today we're going to hear from Dr. Brewer, and he's going to be talking about siblings. Now, if you're having a lot of family time, this, this uh, story might be good for you to hear. He's going to be talking about three siblings, Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. So I encourage the kids, as you're listening to Dr. Brewer today, to draw a picture of those three siblings. You can take a picture of them, and then you can email me, and maybe we can find a way to share those great pictures with the congregation. And grown-ups, if you want to do that too, you can. Also, as you're listening to the sermon today, parents, if you have conversation with your kids and you have some questions, Dr. Brewer will be asking them later. So if you um, want to email him at ask at napc.org, you can do that. And so right now, as we continue to worship together, let us hear from Dr. Brewer. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I greet you this morning. I am feeling great, uh, but we actually recorded this on Friday. And the reason why is my wife, Carolyn, has been feeling a little sick and coughing, and I'm sure she's fine. I'm sure it's not COVID-19. But we want to protect the staff and be sensitive to this great team with some extra precaution. Uh, Josh is here with me. He's a safe, a way safe social distance, 150 feet away from me in the sound booth. And when I get done, we'll hose this thing off and hand it back to the team this morning for you. This is the third Sunday of Lent, and we remember that he paid a debt that he did not owe because we owed a debt that we could not pay. If uh, you are tuning in for the first time, we have been looking at the journey of the children of Israel in the wilderness. And we saw it, 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 today it's more than serendipitous that the passage that I picked two months ago has to do with the time of the children of Israel when there is um, an outbreak, a contagion, and a quarantine time. We saw it two weeks ago that when we're in the wilderness, that it's very easy, first of all, for us to complain. We saw it last week. Two weeks ago, we saw that God leads different in different ways. The cloud in the daytime, the pillar of fire at night, same God leading us. And when we're in our wilderness times, like all of us are right now, the Lord wants to lead. We just need to be willing to follow. And then we saw last week the complaining. It's so easy to do when life changes and we get so frustrated. And we saw, though, that the antidote the complaining is choosing to trust the Lord. Well, we find out this morning, and when we're taking a look of the place God is going, there's still complaining going on, but a different sort. <clears throat> I'm sure you've uh, heard of the uh, Trappist, young man becoming a Trappist monk for the first time. They take the vow of silence. They're allowed at Lent to say two words. It's the only thing they can say all year long. So he does his first year, he comes around, and the head monk says to him, what do you have to say? And he said, bed hard. And so I said, okay. So he went back. He prayed and worked the next year, comes back with two words this year. He said, food lousy. Monk said, wow. So he went ahead and one more year, came back the third year. He sat down and he says, what would you like to say this year? And he said, I quit. And the head monk said, I understand why. You've done nothing but complain ever since you got here. And you know, it's easy for us when we get in the wilderness to complain. But one of the things that takes place, it's a very natural but it's not helpful and it's not healthy, jealousy and division. When we go through wilderness experiences, it's very easy to have jealousy and to divide and blame others. My goodness, right now, the Americans are blaming China, China's blaming the U.S., young are blaming the older boomers for being overreactive, boomers are blaming the young for being insensitive, and of course, Democrats and Republicans just have to complain about each other no matter what goes on. But what we find out, the antidote to the jealousy that we have when we're going through tough times, is very simple. It's the inoculation of faith and love. Faith in knowing that God still holds us and he won't let go of us. 
and love, loving those pilgrims that we are traveling with on this journey. And as we come to this place, it's understanding that God cares for all of us in all places. Well, what, there's three great cycles. You know, there's so many threes in the Old Testament, the Tanakh, Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim, our Jewish friends call the Old Testament. Because you see threes all over. And of course, for me, I think it's representative of the Trinity and also Christ's three days. But there are three great, if you will, patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. There are three great trials that take place. There are going the places of the cycles. They go from Sinai, they meet God. Kadesh, they meet God. The plains of Moab. We find out in Deuteronomy, there's three great speeches by Moses as he looks back before they go into the promised land. So we have this map that we have been looking at the past couple of weeks. No one knows the exact places that they're going, but we can know the places at where they stop. As they come out of Egypt and they make their way across the Red Sea, and they're coming down towards Sinai. This, by the way, takes them about a matter of weeks, but they stay camped at Sinai for a year, right about there, where God gives them the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, and then they head back north. It's supposed to be about a 20-day walk up to the Promised Land, and as they're coming up, they make their way over, and they're going to find a safer route, and right here they send in the 12 spies, remember? And the 12 spies say, we can't do it, or 10 of the 12. So they wander. God sends them back for the next 40 years. They said, our children will be captured. God says, you're not going to make it, but your children are. And so the Lord leads them after this up to the other side of the Transjordan, across from where Jericho is, before they go into the promised land. And God is with them in this whole journey. His patience is remarkable. And as, as he leads them, we find out as he takes them along that there's always these three great, if you will, travelogues taking place. From the Red Sea to Sinai, that's in Exodus. From Sinai to Kadesh, and from Kadesh to the plains of Moab. And God is with them. What's interesting here, when we get to the 12th chapter, they, uh, and this is before they send the spies in, that notice what takes place here. There's complaining again, but it's complaining of a, a different kind here. Now, while they were at Hazaroth, Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married. For he had indeed married a Cushite woman. And they said, has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very humble or meek, more than anyone else on the face of the earth. Suddenly the Lord came to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Come out, you three, to the tent of meeting. So the three of them came out, and the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forward. And he said, Hear my words. When there are prophets among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to them in visions. I speak to them in dreams. Not so with my servant Moses. He is entrusted with all my house. With him I speak face to face, clearly not in riddles. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. When the cloud went away from over the tent, Miriam had become leprous, as white as snow. And Aaron turned towards Miriam and saw that she was leprous. And Aaron said to Moses, O oh my Lord, do not punish us for a sin that we have so foolishly committed. Do not let her be like one stillborn whose flesh is half consumed when it comes out of its mother's womb. And Moses cried to the Lord, O oh God, please heal her. But the Lord said to Moses, If her father had spit in her face, would she not bear her shame for seven days? Let her be shut out of the camp for seven days, and after that she might be brought in again. So Miriam was shut out of the camp for seven days, and the people did not set out on the march until Miriam had been brought in again. After that, the people set out from Hazaroth and camped in the wilderness of Paran. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, what a story there. First of all, what is their big complaint? And Moses might have had more than one wife. We don't know for sure. Is this a, another nickname or is this probably a different wife? And she's a Cushite. She's North African. And so they're complaining because he married her. And then they say, who made Moses king? Doesn't God speak to us too? And the Lord hears it. 
And the Lord is upset. And what I love about the Torah, the first five books of Moses, it's really kind of God's coloring book. This is a Bronze Era uh, document. And God is revealing himself to these people who were slaves in Egypt. The only religion they have had, other than hearing about the patriarchs, was Egyptian theology. And they're learning that God feels, not in a capricious way. In fact, the word that he has here, anger, we talked about before when we were looking at our emotions. The Hebrew word is af, and it means nostrils, like when you... And so the Lord is upset with them. And so he comes down and he stands at the meeting place and he says, let's talk. And he says, Moses and I have a relationship that you are not to be so jealous of. And that's the strange thing about, as Shakespeare said, the green-eyed monster of jealousy that raises its ugly head in our life and all. Who do we really think that we're competing against? And then for God, the crime is the punishment. Leprosy becomes a sign of lack of faith and of sin. Leprosy, and whether it was Hansen's disease or what, Really, the reason there was so much disfiguring was it numbs it. You don't feel anymore. You could break things. You could cut yourself, get infected and not know. And that's why it becomes the parallel of sin. Sin is deadening. And not only deadly, it's deadening. We think sin is the exciting stuff. That's why we're all tempted to do it, because life will be better. And it's the exact opposite. And so God says she becomes a leper. What's interesting here is this is Moses. He intercedes on her behalf. The person that was complaining about him and dissing him and competing with him, Moses says, Lord healer. It's interesting that word now, Moses was the meekest man who ever lived. It has here humble. Meek doesn't mean soft. Moses is so meek Remember, as a young man, he sees an Egyptian beating a fellow Hebrew, and Moses kills him with his hands. That's how meek he is. Meekness means you do what is right, and you leave the results to God. And so Moses has no problem intervening at all. You know, it's, it's more than FOMA, the fear of missing out. It's really the fear of God not caring. And right now, with this coronavirus going around, and people say, why does this person get it and that person not get it? Very common question for all of humanity. In fact, Jesus, remember one time he said, remember the people who Pilate killed in the middle of worship? Do you think they were worse? Or the Tower of Siloam falls on them? Do you think they were worse? They weren't. In other words, there are some things that you and I can't completely piece together. But I know one thing. When people speak against me, the last thing I want to do is pray for them. I uh, can confess to you, I remember uh, one time early in my ministry, there was a pastor who uh, did not like me. I know that's hard to believe, not like moi. And he was saying some really bad stuff about me. And I didn't know what to do. And someone said, when you don't know what to do, pray for them. I thought, all right. So I prayed, you know, kind of creative, forgiving. Oh, you're upset. And you go, Lord, be with them, be with them. And I finally got a peace over it. And then I saw him drive by me in a car one day, and those old feelings came back, and then I felt the Lord say, pray for him. And I said, all right, Lord, may he be a burnt offering. Like, nope, nope, wrong prayer, wrong prayer. Intercede on his behalf. And when you and I learned that reflex, and it's a learned skill, it doesn't come natural, we get so much more freedom in life. But it does bring up the big question of, why does one person go through this and this other person does not? It's called the theodicy question. That's just a 50 cent word meaning God's justice. Uh, the great Cambridge professor put it this way. If God were loving, he would want his creatures to be happy. If God were all powerful, God could do what he wanted. The creatures are har far from happy. So either God is not loving, or not all-powerful, or maybe neither. And it looks like it's a shut case. Until you open up, and you just have to ask a, question, a couple questions. What does all-powerful mean? Can God do everything? But one thing God can't do, nonsense. 
God cannot make red be blue simultaneously because by definition, it's a different wavelength. Just because we say, can God do this, doesn't mean you said anything linguistically accurate. Sometimes we're saying nonsense and God can't do that. God can't give you or me freedom and take away the ability of consequences. I know, that's tough. But that's the way this world is. It's all so beautiful. Well, why doesn't God make us when someone's going to be mean? Why doesn't he just stop their brain? Well, that would stop behavior, but it wouldn't change character. Well, obviously, God can't do that. But if a loving God would want us to be happy, well, by love, do we mean just strictly kindness? Kindness is a part of love. It's when you make somebody feel good. Love is wishing someone's highest welfare, Clive Stable said. And so when you want that, the best for them, that's love. You don't have to like anybody to love them, to want the best for them. Very often when you and I pray the Lord's Prayer, Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. What we a lot of times mean in our flesh, Lord, deliver us from struggle. Because we don't want a hard life. Who would want a hard life? God understands these things, but he loves us too much. Sometimes when we ask God to love us more, we're asking, asking him to love us less. You know, if you're just an artist and you're just doing a little sketch, it doesn't have to look right. But if it's your life's work, you'll give it infinite amount of trouble. You will erase and rearrest. You will make it perfect. When Michelangelo was doing the Sistine Chapel, he was driving the Pope crazy because he would have this beautiful picture and he would say, it's not good enough. Because when they see this, they'll see Michelangelo. And God, rather than just making us a little caricature, kind of like Jesus, he says, no, I'm going to see this all the way through. When an owner loves their dog or their cat, well, just giving in to what the dog and cat wants all the time is not loving. In fact, what's interesting, we as humans take our pets and we make them more like ourselves for our benefit but it's also for the animal's benefit. You see a dog in the wild or a cat in the wild compared to the life of Fifi at home? God does that with us. Or a parent with a child. We all know in the art of raising human beings that very often discipline is love. God says in Scripture time and time again, I discipline those whom I love and I chastise those whom I call my very own. And sometimes God lets us go through stuff that, wow, we would never do. And when we say, stop, won't you love us? Wrong way of saying it. God, interesting, does he not have feelings? And God feels every tear that you and I do. Jesus was tempted in every way as you and I, a man acquainted with sorrows and grief, and yet not, never sinned in one way. I remember uh, I was discipled by a Messianic Jew, a Pole named Eliezer Erbach, whose whole family was destroyed by the Nazis. He himself was captured and taken into Russia, uh, not by the Nazis, but by the Soviet Union. His brother died in his arms in a gulag. He also fought for the birth of Israel, and the Presbyterian ministers brought him to Jesus. But what's interesting, I remember watching him one time on a interview with a local rabbi who really had an attitude, said to Eleazar, you're not, because he believed in Jesus as the Messiah, he said, you're not a Jew anymore. And Eleazar said, to Hitler, I was a Jew. And then he said, where was God in these death camps? This guy was pretty much an agnostic. And Eleazar said, he was there and he wept. God doesn't leave us in these times when it feels these dark hours of the soul, but he's there. You know, I, I can say what someone told me once. I am 66 years old in a couple of months, and I can remember being in a seminary with a newborn. By the way, uh, prime was 21%, then our first mortgage was 18%. But I remember an older gentleman telling me when I was complaining about life, he said, you know, kid, it's not as good as they told you it was, and it's not as bad as you think, that the Lord is there. 
And Jesus, likewise, when we go through the storms of life, like Roxy so wonderfully showed last week with the children. Let's take a look at this passage a little closer. Matthew, the 8th chapter and the 23rd verse. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. A windstorm arose on the sea so great that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. And they went and woke him up saying, Lord, save us, we're perishing. And he said to them, why are you afraid? You have little faith. And he got up and rebuked the winds in the sea, and there was a dead calm. And they were amazed. The word is really frightened, saying, what sort of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? This is the word of the Lord. Jesus was with them in the boat. He was God, yes, but he was also fully human. Fully human, fully God. A hypostatic union, perfectly blended. And he was tired. So tired in the middle of the storm. And these are professional sailors, a lot of them. This is a bad storm in Galilee. And they wake him up and say, you don't care that we're going to drown? And Jesus, wiping the sleep from his eyes, says, what are you doing? Why are you so afraid? And then he says to the storm, chill out. And it stops. And as they're sitting there rocking in the boat, something scares them and terrifies them more than that storm. It's this guy. Who has power like that? When I was in seminary, I was thinking this week, I had a fellow seminarian who told me he fell madly in love. He was told me this through another pastor, and she broke up with him. And he was, I mean, depressed beyond. I mean, couldn't even go to class as he tells the story. And this professor that he had, I think it was uh, in the systematic theology, wrote him a note. This is long before the days of cell phones, smartphones, or even pagers. It's a weird thing. It's called writing. <laughs> and he wrote him a note, and he just put on it Matthew 8, 27. And he said, the boat won't sink, and the storm won't last forever. Well, he went, went through life, and he actually, the girl got back together with him, and they got married. And two years into his first pastor, that she just, they wanted a child so bad, and she couldn't get pregnant. And he wrote back to this professor, and the professor said he would pray for him, and he always signs it, Matthew 8, 27. The boat won't sink, and the storm won't last forever. Well, she did conceive and delivered a beautiful little boy. And at 18 months, he was becoming terminally ill. And he wrote to this professor again, and the professor said, the boat won't sink and the storm won't last forever. And the little boy died. And this pastor wrote a letter to this professor friend and said, we lost him. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But the boat won't sink and the storm won't last forever. And if you want to call them up this morning, they're in Northern California and they have two adult children and three wonderful grandkids. You know, I know when we go through these storms, it's hard to believe that God is with us. But as they say, God's eye is on both the thermostat, he knows how hot we can go through, and the timer, how long we can take it. And God compliments us in a way we don't want. We say, Lord, I can't take this. I cannot take this. God says, bring me your concerns. Bring these to me. We all go through rough waters. We will. But Christ is in your boat. And if you have never given your life to Christ, this is the time to do that. And say, Lord, come, take my life. You take all you know of you and you give it to all you know of him. And he will bring a peace into your life. God someday is going to stop all these storms. It might get rougher before it gets easier. But someday there's a glorious eternity that is waiting for us. But in the meantime, we can ask him to stop the storm in our hearts right now. Let's pray. 
God, I thank you that you are one who understands, and not only understands, but who feels, Lord Jesus. You know what we go through. And Lord, I thank you that very often when we have people that speak against us, that Lord, you ask us to pray for them. And Lord, thank you that at times you, you put some of us in time out because you love us so much and to bring us back. Lord, may we likewise keep the doors open of people that we feel estranged from. And Lord, I thank you for all of my brothers and sisters here at North Avenue for this great staff and the elders and the deacons and God, all the wonderful people sitting in the pews and those at home right now gathered around computers or phones. God, I thank you and I pray your richest blessing. And Lord, what a time for us to show the world that we have a Savior and therefore we can risk helping them. And we pray this for the glory of the one who gave it all, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, thank you, Dr. Brewer, for that powerful word. So when we are afraid, we can trust in God. And one of the ways that we demonstrate that trust is by going boldly before the throne of grace, as Hebrews 4.16 declares, and bring to the Lord the desires of our hearts. I will pray for us this morning, but invite you to join your heart with me in prayer from where you are watching. But let me also remind you that we can pray for you if you will send us an email to prayer at napc.org. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we come before you this morning because you are the only one who can quiet the storm. We come before you this morning because we are fearful. It is hard not to be fearful as life goes on normally, but add to it a genuine pandemic. And we confess, Lord, that we find ourselves, our minds wandering towards the fear. We ask, Lord, that you would, by the power of your Holy Spirit, surround us and surround our fear and bring it into your heart so that it might be quieted within our hearts. We come before you this morning with some specific prayer requests. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for those across the globe who are already sick with this COVID-19 virus. We pray for those who are afraid of getting it. We pray for those who are afraid for their loved ones. And we pray for those who are grieving because of it. We also know that in the normal course of things, people get sick unrelated to this virus and that there are many in the hospital who are currently struggling and we lift them to you, people who we know in our lives and who we care about. And in particular, we pray for Ed Van Winkle's grandson, Mark Curtis, who is in the hospital in Winston-Salem and who needs still a diagnosis for what it is that is wrong with him so that he can be treated. We lift Mark up to you and ask that you would give wisdom and power to all those who are taking care of him. Lord, this morning we are particularly mindful of those who feel isolated. For those who are alone in their apartments watching this worship service. And we pray for them. We pray that they would know that they are known and loved by none else than the creator of the universe who has promised that not a hair can fall from their heads apart from your sovereign will. But we also know that you have bound us together in the body of Christ. And you not only that have bound us, you have called us brothers and sisters that we belong to one another, that we belong in the family. And so we ask that you would place on our hearts the names of those in our lives and in this congregation who are feeling lonely and isolated. 
And when those names come to us, Lord, at the very least, may we lift them up to you in prayer. But by your spirit, would you also nudge us to send a text message or an email or make a phone call so that we might reach out to each other, so that we might remind one another that though some of us are currently feeling lonely, we are not alone, especially in our belonging to the body of Christ. For those, on the other hand, whose households are very full, who are adapting to college students who have returned home and are grieving the loss of their communities, for those who have young children who are at home all day and are trying to juggle the responsibility of helping their children do their schooling online while they also are doing their work online, we ask for help. We ask for encouragement. We ask for the ability of families to find this to be an unexpected and sweet time of being united together. And in the midst of that, we're reminded of those who now have no work because of the effects of this pandemic on our economy, and because of the request of our government that we not interact with one another. So we pray for financial resources to be made available who, for those whose jobs have been suspended or even terminated because of this season that we are in. We pray for provision for them. We lift Barbara Rodriguez to you with joy that she has been released from the hospital and is recovering at home, and we pray that you would be with her in her recovery. And we come before you again asking for Everett's healing, miraculous, unexpected, inexplicable. Would you heal the heart of this little boy? And would you guard the hearts of his mom, Kelly, and his dad, Jeremy, and his little sister, Isla, as they walk this very difficult road with him, especially now that they are so limited in being able to see him because of this virus. We pray for the church that your spirit would would nudge us and urge us and encourage us into a posture of prayer in ways that we've never experienced before. Would you use even this, one of the darkest experiences in our collective memory, to bring revival to your people, to bring revival to your church across the globe, that we might profess the goodness of God even in the difficulty of the storm. We pray for those who have been doing this work across the globe, missionaries of every denomination, in particular those in our denomination, many of whom have been called home, who are now trying to find a way to push pause on their ministries where they are in order to return to the United States, and also those who cannot leave where they are because the country's borders have been closed. It seems, Lord, that for every request that we have, there is this equal and opposite request. And all that we know to do is to bring them all before you and not feel like we have to sort them out for ourselves, but that we can trust you with everything, all things. And so together we unite our voices wherever we are, praying the prayer that Jesus taught us that is sufficient, that begins, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
It is our practice to offer part of what we have to the Lord as a discipline. So in this moment, Josh is going to come forward and offer an offertory for us. We will feast in the house of Zion. And I invite you, if you are able, to bring an offering before the Lord. But we do recognize that this is a difficult time for some of you. So if you cannot bring a financial offering before the Lord in one of the ways that you see on the screen, let me invite you to bring the offering of yourself, of your heart, of your time through prayer, of your care for one another as an offering that is pleasing and acceptable to God. We will feast in the house of Zion. We will sing with our hearts restored. He has done great things. We will say together, we will feast and weep no more. We will not be burned by the fire. He is the Lord our God. We are not consumed by the flood, upheld, protected, gathered up. We will feast in the house of Zion. We will sing with our hearts restored. He has done great things. We will say together, we will feast and weep no more. In the dark of night, before the dawn, my soul be not afraid. For the promised morning, oh, how long, oh, God of Jacob, be my strength. We will feast in the house of Zion. We will sing with our hearts restored. He has done great things. We will say together, we will feast and weep no more. Every vow we've broken and betrayed, you are the faithful one, and from the garden to the grave. Bind us together, bring shalom. We will feast in the house of Zion. We will sing with our hearts restored. He has done great things. We will say together, we will feast and weep no more. Yes, we will feast and weep no more. One of the things that we have said in these days is that we don't know what to believe because it seems like there are a lot of competing messages. So I invite you to remember that we do know what to believe when it comes to who God is 
and what God has promised for us. And so together, we're going to recite the Apostles' Creed. You'll find the words on your screen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let me remind you before we sing our closing hymn that you can reach out to us with prayer requests at prayer at napc.org. You can ask a question about the sermon with ask at napc.org. And you can reach any member of our staff simply by putting their first name, Megan, at napc.org. You just have to spell our names correctly. I'm M-E-G-A-N, no H, and Brian has a Y in his name, B-R-Y-A-N. Let's sing together as we close out this worship service. to continue for a few weeks this blessing that was sung last week. And as you learn this melody, we invite you to sing this along over those whom you are gathered with and those who might be uh, on your mind as we have prayed together. May the Lord bless us and keep us May the Lord smile on us, shine his light upon us. May the Lord lift us, turn his face towards us, and give us his peace, give us his peace. Go now in peace. Go now in peace. Go now in peace. Well, if Dr. Brewer were here, he would invite you to open a hand toward the Lord, knowing that your burdens are in that hand and God can take them. And with your other hand, 
lift to the Lord the invitation, the welcoming of God's blessings. And with our arms open wide, may we remember that though we do not go from the places where we are because of this season we are in, we can still go to one another in prayer and in friendship and in tender caring. So go from this service into the lives that God has called us to leave in peace. In the strong name of Jesus, amen.